For those visiting New York City, going to the Metropolitan Museums is a must. These long-standing pillars of artistic history have braved the sandy winds of time for ages and have held many visitors under its roof. One of the most visited Metropolitan Museums is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This house of culture gathers artwork from the many corners of the world and crafts it into an experience bound to leave anyone in awe. The New York Tribune of 1913 described the Metropolitan Museum as the great conservator of our artistic standards. Emerging from extravagant roots, John Taylor Johnston, a young lawyer, decided to expand the small railroad business he had. This railroad, which was called the Central Railroad of New Jersey, was one of Johnston's first endeavors at leading an organization. This railroad brought in huge sums of money annually, so when the New York Metropolitan Fair needed art to attract more people, Johnston was happy enough to donate some of his pieces. Through his numerous donations of art, Johnston was able to form the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, from being the president of the Central Railroad of New Jersey to becoming the first president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, John Taylor Johnston had a momentous impact on today's society. Johnston was a leader throughout his time in the workforce, as can be seen in his aforementioned roles, and his legacy is imprinted in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the impression it leaves on every person who visits. Johnston was born to successful Scottish parents on April 8, 1820. His father was a prosperous businessman, and his mother was a housewife. While on a long trip to visit his parents' roots in Scotland, he studied at Edinburgh High School, where he was named Ducks, or top of the class. Eventually, after going back to the U.S., he graduated from the University of the City of New York in 1839, and studied law at Yale University for two years. At that time, New York was entering a time period known today as the Gilded Age of Philanthropy. Lasting from 1870 to 1900, this era was noted in America by its booming industry. With the rising industry, there were many new opportunities for individuals seeking their fortune. Johnson quickly rose to the top with the waves of the escalating economy. After being admitted to the New York Bar in 1843, Johnston felt dissatisfied with his job. He traveled abroad for two years and then purchased a small railroad business that connected Somerville and Elizabethtown, both located in New Jersey. It was at this business that he directed all his resources and attention to expanding his company. New York City's art life was vibrant even before the Metropolitan Museum existed. The 19th century was full of movements and events in the art world. Some popular museums included Barnum's American Museum and the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, both of which challenged societal norms. Barnum's dealt with controversial issues, often inciting angry remarks from the public, and was burned down twice. MoMA was the product of the visions of three women, who worked with a group of both women and men to create a museum that would step away from the old-fashioned principles of traditional values and into the light of the modern and cosmopolitan. John Taylor Johnson's beliefs went along with those of the visionaries of the time, as he believed that art could have a civilizing effect on those who it was viewed by. Johnson firmly believed that museums were essential to preserve artistic appreciation and emotional growth in society. As time went by, he started to build a personal art collection that was eventually put on display at a stable at 8 Fifth Avenue. This collection was known as one of the best in the city, and quickly became popular. The collection also proved to be useful when sanitary commissions from different cities began setting up fundraising events in support of the Union Army from 1863 through 1865. They became known as sanitary fairs, which were collections of fine arts, crafts, and commercial goods put on display. The New York Metropolitan Sanitary Fair was by far the most successful, as it raised over $1 million. Held in April of 1864, it was the most tremendous collection of art assembled up till that point, with almost 600 paintings on view. Collections were lent by people who would later donate those same paintings to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Among these people was our very own John Taylor Johnston, whose personal art collection was not only fundamental to the sanitary fair, but also to the museum. On April 13, 1870, the New York State Legislature granted an act of incorporation to the project, and work began in earnest. Johnson was by no means a disinterested bystander at the creation of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Re-elected president annually between 1870 and 1889, Johnson worked with great energy and diligence to bring the art museum into form. In early 1871, he gave $10,000 to the project, making him the single largest subscriber in that year's fund drive. In March 1871, 
Johnson and his fellow trustee William T. Blodgett collaborated in a joint effort to expand the Mets art collection. They each laid down $116,000, which was later reimbursed, for a collection of paintings from Europe, mainly Dutch and Flemish, that became the essential nucleus on which the museum's reputation would be built. In 1871, the museum moved into the Dodworth Building at 681 Fifth Avenue and remained there for one year. During this time, the gallery was open to the public on the virtually free basis that has since remained a cornerstone of the museum's policy. In 1873, Johnson hit the jackpot once again. For $60,000, he bought the collection of Cypriot antiquities that had been brought together by General Louis Palma di Cesnola, who was an Italian by birth and a U.S. citizen by choice. The museum moved to the Douglas Mansion from 1873 through 1879, and in 1877, Cesnola became the secretary of the museum before becoming the director in 1879. Johnson was a well-respected public figure, and his efforts to bring in donations of art were well met. Even today, numerous people donate brilliant works of art to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. On March 30, 1880, the museum was open to the public for the first time in its Central Park location. Johnson gave a reception and luncheon at his home prior to the 3.30 p.m. ceremony, which was sadly one of the last of his triumphs in the art world. As the decade advanced, he experienced failing health, and in February 1889, the trustees accepted his resignation, while at the same time making him honorary president for life. Johnson was succeeded in the presidency by Henry G. Markand. Before his death in New York City, Johnson made a bequest for monies that would later be used to cover the cost of the Italian Renaissance cast for the museum. Due to both his generosity and later that of his family members, the John Taylor Johnson collection became a permanent part of the museum. John Taylor Johnson died at his residence on 8 Fifth Avenue at the age of 73 due to creeping paralysis, which is now known as multiple sclerosis. He left behind a monument of culture that would later become one of the most famous museums in the world. Without John Taylor Johnson's dedication and charisma, the Metropolitan Museum of Art would not exist as it is known today. Sure, there were a variety of museums that were popular even before he joined the group of trustees that built the Met, but most of those museums did not have as broad of a spectrum as the Metropolitan Museum does today. John Taylor Johnson built the foundation for a museum that would encompass almost every type of art from every era of every culture. The founders of the Met, we're talking about 1870, wanted a museum in which many representative examples of the great art of the world could be presented. We've shown over the last 130, 140 years that uh, some of the great treasures of mankind could be acquired and are in fact here. Inside is a dazzling three-dimensional encyclopedia of world art, overwhelming in the variety and outstanding quality of its collections. If someone walking down the street was asked what their opinion was on John Taylor Johnson, chances are that person would have no idea who he was. He does not rank up on the top 20 list of influential historical figures to everyone, and is not as widely recognized as people like Albert Einstein, but his contribution to society is permanent. The Met has honored him as it owns a multitude of his portraits. He generously donated his personal collection to the museum so it could be built upon year by year to form an extensive and varied accumulation of art. The Met has also shown the Johnson collection of engraved gems, and the John Taylor Johnson collection is a permanent part of the museum. Today, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is one of the most popular attractions in New York City. Its collection is diverse, ranging from oceanic masts to Greco-Roman sculptures to contemporary photography. For a small fee, a museum full of history and adventure is open to anyone. John Taylor Johnson would have been proud to see how far the museum has come and the impact it has had on society. The Metropolitan Museum of Art's mission requires that it remain a work in progress. No museum in the world uh, stops collecting. No matter how much you have, there are always gaps. One never has so complete a picture that you can simply close the book. We'll never know everything. That, of course, is the joy of scholarship. There's always something else to learn and to know. That's the wonder of works of art. They, they're unfathomable. You, you cannot complete them. You cannot complete them.